So this morning we're going to talk about the red roof and the river. How many of you like to be free? In Christ you have freedom not to do whatever you want. You have freedom from the sin that binds your life. That when you screw it up, his sacrifice is there and already paid that you, you get another chance with God. You can't willingly go out and sin. Then, then you're kind of on your own there. But for all the ignorance that we have in, in our lives, and how many of you know we're ignorant in life quite a bit, uh, God's grace is there to cover that. So this morning I wanted to talk about the red roof and the river. Uh, we are transitioning and moving into something different within this church. And actually we have been for a while. Um, we've been in a place for years that we are um, we're growing we're loving as a church family. We're doing all these great things. But there's always something that when you're in a place, God's always waiting and ready to move you into another. Amen. Our lives are lived in progression. They're never meant to stay the same. You should be different year to year, week to week, month to month. And no matter how long something can feel like it takes, in God's timing, it opens up and it's right. Amen. Amen. So what God does in you, you can be like, man, I felt something. Have you ever felt something for God? Let's just seal that up. You're like, man, God's put a promise. There's a thought. There's something in me that I just, I know it's for me and God. But it hasn't come to pass yet. It's something that maybe he put in there years ago. And it can feel like forever before it ever happens. And maybe it still hasn't happened. But, you know, the longer you wait, the sweeter that's going to be. Amen. More, the, the more you have patience the more there is provision. Just because it's God's hand that is allowing those things to either happen or to wait until the right time to happen. There is no yes and no with God. There's just simply, okay, it's right now, or you're going to wait a little bit more. The Bible says the promises of God are what? Yes and amen. There's there's no no. God doesn't tell you no. He simply says, just wait a little bit longer. He's not saying yes at this moment, then he's saying have patience. So know that, that if you've got a promise, if you've got something in your heart, that you're just like, man, I I know it was God, but I just don't see it. I just don't have that yet. Well, I can be one that can attest to you if you'll just keep waiting. And it's the hardest thing to do whether you're saved or not saved yet. Waiting's tough, amen? Amen. I don't even like to wait pumping gas in the car. I'm just, I'll hit the trigger and go sit back in the car because I don't want to stand out there. But how many of you remember the days when you had to stand there and hold the pump? You know, you, you could, there was no trigger. There was no, okay, you got to wait on this. Okay, let me really date some of you. How many of you remember when gas was leaded and unleaded? Oh, my goodness, you're still young. Yeah. So, you know, you got times when you're, if you think back in your life, you're always having to find patience. You're always having to wait on some of those things. But the results of that waiting is always good. If you got your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to go into Ephesus this morning and look at the church and look at some admonishment, some encouragement from Paul to the church. Ephesians 4 verse 1 through 6. No matter where you are, the Lord's always loving and wanting to bring things together. He loves unity. Amen. That's why congregations look the way they do, especially in our church. There's so many different faces. There's different colors. There's different families, different nationalities. And we're in a country that's a huge melting pot anyway. He loves to bring the body together. He loves to bring unity into the church. That's exactly what Paul is telling the church here. Verse 1, he says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. How many of you are called by God? Amen. The Bible says that you are to walk worthy of that calling. And by the way, you're all called of God. It's not just certain ones. It's not church leadership. Every single one of us have a calling from God. And Paul says explicitly, you need to walk worthy, which means you do the best at that calling God has called in your life, whatever that is, your path that you're on in life. You do the best to walk worthy of that calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, 
with long suffering, there's that word of patience, bearing with one another in love. Amen. These are the qualities we are to have as human beings, as mankind. This is what's godly. Losing your temper, throwing stuff at your cat, even though that doesn't have to be mad, that can just be fun. But if you're throwing stuff and angry all the time, that's not godly. Sorry. That's allowing emotions and flesh to rule. Don't do that. There is a godly side of anger, but it's against things that are unrighteous, not against somebody who's not letting you get your way. Amen. We'll just keep going. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring to keep the unity, the coming together of all things in the Spirit by the bond of peace. How many of you know you can't have unity if you don't have peace? If there's not peace in the home, then there's definitely not unity, right? There's division. There's oh, you go to your room and I'll go to mine or I'll go sleep on the couch. That's not unity. And I can guarantee you that's not peace. The Lord says, I call that it would be unity in the spirit by the bond of peace. And I love this. Verse four, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Amen. God is one. Literally. Verse five, one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Amen? In Texas, they would say, in y'all. In Oklahoma, we say it correctly, you all. Well, depending on what part of the state you're in, I guess. Uh, Maybe on what street you're on. Probably just in what house you live in, because you're probably some of those that say y'all. Y'all? Yeah. Yeah. So if, if Jesus really is Lord, then it says he is in that one baptism. But there's one God and Father over all. G- the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are not three separate gods. It's just three expressions of the same God. It's one God, and he's Lord of all. He's over all heaven, all earth, all creation. Amen? So when Paul tells him, he says, that you would endeavor to walk worthy in your calling for the unity of the Spirit. By the bond of peace, let peace be the one, the thing that draws you together. Let peace be the one that holds your hands together as you walk together as my body. we got all these body parts. we got all these organs working in our bodies literally right now, keeping us alive and breathing in this church service. Some of them work better than others at this point in our life. But no matter where that is, it's all in unity. It's all working together. What God puts in your lives a lot of times, so early it can feel like, but yet you don't get it at that point. Later on, you'll see when you look back, you'll go, I get it. That early event in my life was called to bring unity later on. That was called to bring God and me just a little bit closer in this place because nothing is a surprise to the Lord. Amen? Hence today, the red roof and the river. Back about, we're going on almost 11 and a half years of being pastors here. Uh, And back about at least 10 years ago, when we were first in this city, um, we were living in the church parsonage on the north end of town. And how many of you remember a man used to live in this town named Dennis Reed? Remember him? Well, when he passed, his wife gave me his motorcycle. She was a part of the church then and and she gave me his motorcycle. It was the first street bike, fully street bike I'd ever had. I grew up on dirt bikes and Enduros. Um, I never stayed on the street much. I always was trying to jump the hills that went over the street. And uh, so I got this street bike from her, and I used to ride around the city in prayer. That's like my excuse to go ride a motorcycle. I said, like, I need to go pray. So I'd get on the bike, and I literally would ride around the city. I'd ride to the streets and ride by churches, just ride all around. And I would ride the perimeter of the city and literally pray over the city. And uh, I still do. I just drive a truck now and, and still drive around and catch things in the spirit. And so one day I was driving, and I just turned down the street, and it was way, way back early. It's probably in that first year or so, maybe, maybe in that second year. And I was riding this bike down the street. And all of a sudden, I just noticed 
something. And I kept riding. I didn't think anything of it. But the moment I saw it, it popped in my spirit. Something, you ever had that? Like you come across something or you, you have a conversation with somebody, and you're like, hmm, that was more important than I think right now. That, that has something to do with something else. Well, it's kind of one of those moments. So I, I rode by it and, and just saw this thing, and I was like, what is that? What is it about that that just kind of, in a sense, doesn't leave me alone? And so I came back to the church, and maybe, I don't know, within a couple of weeks or so, uh, I would ride around, and I, I'd kind of see that here and there, and I was like, what in the world is it about that? And so I asked around, and I said, what is this place? And I asked people in the church, and they're like, well, what are you talking about? Where's it at? I was like, I don't even know. I was like, it's just over in the city. And I said, the only thing I can tell you is it's the place with the red roof. And they would kind of look at me, and they're like, what? And they think about it, and they're like, oh, I know. I bet I know what you're talking about. And so in my, in my heart and in my spirit, it's always been that place with the red roof. It's like the red roof in. Remember those? Yeah. So it was like the Red Roof Inn to me. I was like, that's the place with the Red Roof. And I'd always see it through all these years. You know, we've been here for almost 11 and a half. And all these years, that place always stuck in my spirit. There was something about it. You ever got that? It's just like, how many of you have married or been married in here? Wow. Okay. So me and Melinda are the only ones. Everybody else is in sin, evidently. Okay. We'll have a giant marriage after the fourth when we get back and everybody can get married. We'll really be a cult then if everybody gets married within this church. Okay, so the first time, if you're married or you had a girlfriend or a boyfriend, the first time you saw that person and something just exploded on the inside of you it was not your spleen or your liver. It was just your heart of like, oh, my gosh, she is so beautiful or he is so handsome or whatever you would say about him. Yeah, so that that explosion had always been there. So within that first year, I contacted at, at that time one of my spiritual mentors, Billy Joe Doherty in Tulsa, because we had come out from under his ministry and under Victory Bible and all that stuff, and I emailed him. And I said, if you can, I mean, it's like, it's like you know, a needle in a haystack. It's a long shot. But I said, if you can, I said, would you call me? Because I've got a question about something that I've seen. And I just kind of need some, I need some mentorship. I need some leadership here about what do I do about it? Because it's not leaving me alone, and I don't get it. I don't understand all of this. And so about that next week, one evening, I get a phone call. And I look on the caller ID, and it says, Billy Joe Doherty. And I was like, my first, my first words were, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he's called. And I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I say? And so I picked the phone up. You know, it's like that perfect moment. Where you're like, you're not going to pick it up right on the first ring because you don't want to sound desperate. But you don't want to wait four or five rings because then it might hang up and then you're not there. So you're like, wait, and you're like, two, three, okay. So, you know, you're like, <clears throat> so I pick it up and I'm like, oh, my gosh, what do I say? I'm thinking probably hello. Hello is probably the right word to say when you pick up the phone. And so I put the phone, I picked the phone up and I put it to my ear and I'm getting ready to say, hey, or hello, or probably a good thing I didn't say anything because I probably would have screwed it up. But I picked up the phone and the first three words that I heard literally changed my life forever. And Billy Joe said, go for it, go for it. And you know what my response was? Huh? <laughs> it was not what I was expecting at all. But hearing those three words is something that has echoed in my spirit for at least 10 years now. And I knew the moment I heard that what it meant. And I knew it was, it, that was all I needed. I mean, we talked about some other stuff and, and talked about church and talked about, you know, how's it going? You know, I hear you're pastoring a church, you know. So we were like a, you know, a success story out of Victory Bible, too. So that was kind of cool for him. But we talked about some other things. But those three words, go for it, has always been with me. So every time I would see this, this place with the red roof, that would be there. And so all these years have gone by and at different times, I tried to interact with this place and, and be a part of this place. 
um, work with leadership, work with the organization that's represented there, and all this stuff, and the doors just shut. Have you ever been in those moments? Well, you know it's God, and you're trying to be a part, but they're like, no, no thanks. You know, don't call us, we'll call you type of thing. Well, it would feel like that. You know, and, and for, the, for the record of where we are and what we've done, we don't have any ties to Gaiman. We were sent here as messengers of God. Amen? Minus the weird culty way. You know, we're from across the state. So there is no ties here. When we came here, we literally left everybody and everything we knew to come. We didn't know anybody out here. That's why the church is the way it is right now. Because we don't have anybody else but you guys. You're our family. So we naturally just open up and we naturally are transparent and we're, lo- you know, we try to be loving. Some days might be better than others, but, you know, we just try to be ourselves of who we are on stage and off because you're all that we have. And, and that we hope that that's transferred through the years. But in that place, you know, when you, when you put yourself out there and you kind of put your heart out there, you become vulnerable. Amen. And when you're vulnerable, it leaves the most places for you to get hurt and to be wounded. And so through the years, um, there were some different times when I tried to be a part of this organization, and they just basically said no, and it hurt. The first two times it did, I, it wounded me. The first time, it just kind of sideswiped me, and I was like, ah, uh, okay. The second time when I tried again, it really wounded and hurt because I didn't just hear a no. It was more like, just get away. Just go away. We don't, we don't want you. And if you've ever been shunned or you've ever been just rejected, it hurts. Amen? It's just like, oh. And so through the years with that kind of in there, you know, and you try to forgive and you try to work stuff out, but it's always just kind of, it's just a wound, you know. If somebody stabs you in the arm, yeah, it can heal, but you're always going to have a memory of where that was, or you're going to remember, oh, man, that spot's got the scar, and that's what happened. There was, a, there was a scar tissue there. And so, you know, I'd work through it and work past it. And a couple of years ago, I went back to this place and literally was asking. We were trying to find a place for our Easter program a couple of years ago, and of course, you know, we don't have the room. We can't even meet in one service in here, and we, we can't even park. If you don't get here an hour before service almost, you don't get a parking spot. you got to park in somebody else's yard. you got to park down the block, and I'm like, I've looked out the door for a service time or two just to look, and I'm like, oh, gosh, because as a pastor, that's not good for us because it shows everybody else you don't have the room to take care of your people. So it's a knock against leadership because, you know, in all efforts, we're CEOs of companies. So if your company can't take care of its people, it doesn't look good. It's not a good practice. And so I look down and I see cars down all blocks, down about a block each direction. We're taking over the Methodist parking lot. We're taking over the, the accountant parking lot over here. We did take over VIP until they just got the nerve and bought the property. And so now we lost that parking lot. And I'm just like, God. Apartments come over and took over and took our parking lot there. So, you know, this this property and this space was never really geared to hold a lot of people, obviously, because we, we don't really hold the hold this very well. So all these years had gone by, and we were trying to find a place for our Easter program. And we were calling around, looking around. I was looking for different places. And so I contacted this organization again. was like, hey, could we possibly use your, your place to uh, hold an Easter program because we're just needing the space. It's got a perfect space for it. You know, we'll, bring, we'll do all the work. We'll bring all the chairs. We'll do everything. Just can we just simply use the space? And they said, well, we'll, we'll ask our leadership team, but uh, I don't know. We'll have to get back to you. So they did, and they asked him, and they come back, and they said, hey, I got an answer for you. Why don't you stop by my office, and I'll talk with you about it. I was like, all right, cool. Well, maybe maybe we'll get it. And they go in there, and they're like, um, you know, we talked about it. They said no, and uh, there's too much liability. You know, you guys got a lot of people, so we just don't think that's a good idea. And I was like, okay. You know, I was just kind of reserved, kind of like, okay, like it's just not going to work. But then the gear shifted a little bit, and I said, and also, I know why you're here. And this will be the last time we'll talk about this. I was like, I I don't think we're talking about anything at this point. You're doing all the talking. But I sat there and listened anyway. And they said, 
you will not ever be in this property. You will not ever be a part of this property. I do not want you back here again. And I just, I wanted to say, you know, that's the non-Christian side of us we have to deal with sometimes. I was like, you're the one that invited me here. I didn't come here on my own. But I left that place and that wound was opened all over again. And if anything has ever hurt me in this town, it's that. Because we don't have any ties here otherwise. We don't have, you can't hurt my feelings. I don't know you until you got, until we got here and then I met you. But I didn't, you, I didn't grow up with you, you know. You're not like a, a lifelong buddy or family. You know, nobody hurts like family, right? Yeah, it's because they're in your heart. They've been with you the longest. Uh, you know, if you hurt me, then I'll just punch you in the arm and ignore you the rest of my life. No problem. We'll get over that. But when you open your heart and you put it out there, that's the risk you run in a relationship is it getting hurt. That's why marriages are so wonderful or can hurt so bad. It's because all of you is out there. And so in that third time of being rejected and really being slapped, not literally, but spiritually across the face to say, ha ha, no, never I left that place, and I was hurt and sad, kind of wanted to cry, but more angry than anything. The other times, I just wanted to cry. Uh, For some of you who are new and here or don't know, a couple years ago, I found Jesus. And and so I just, I have to deal with, like, wanting to cry up here often, and I never did. So it's like the waterworks get turned on, and I'm like, oh, great, here that comes again. So I left that place, and I didn't really want to cry as much as I was angry. And I left and I said, and the Lord said, never again will you come back here. Never again will you have to ask. And I said, yes, sir, I am never coming back here. And I think we ended up renting the Texas County Activity Center, had to rent out that whole complex and had a great Christmas program, went on fine, had several hundred people there. And it was great, wonderful time. But in the midst of that, I still had this place with the red roof hurting in my heart. How many of you know when God puts something there, it's usually for a reason? The biggest time when you have hurts in your life isn't for the fact that somebody did you wrong. It's for the fact that God wants to grow you up on the inside. And he wants you to be stronger and more mature through it. So about three months ago, remember the Lord said, never again will you go and ask. But this, this place with the red roof would never leave me alone. Within that same year of, of seeing this place the first time, I gave a word in this church. I said, God is about to do something in this region. And I said, in a physical sign of this, some of you have been here a while, I might remember this word. I said, a physical sign of what God is going to do spiritually is that the Cimarron River is going to start running again. And I didn't even really know. I mean, I knew of it, but I didn't know where it was at. Didn't really know any of the geography, really. But... I just kind of, I gave that word, and I felt it really strong. And I was like, okay, that's a sign to look for. And about a couple of months later, we were getting ready to go to church camp, and Eli Garman, if anybody remember him, he's pastoring up in Michigan now, uh, he came to me right, right before we were leaving. I think it maybe was that day, if I remember correctly. He said, did you hear about the Cimarron River? And I was like, of course, you know, that perked my ears. I was like, no, what? And they're like, it's running again. Like, it's the craziest thing because it hasn't ran in years. Like, it, you know, you can get a lot of rain and you can get water in there. But, like, it's running. It's actually got a fluid stream that's staying and going through it. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, I, you know, I'm sure the waters maybe always was there, but now it's running. And it's never stopped running since then. So literally every time we go across the state going over to see family, we cross that between Woodward and Enid. Going, going down Highway 3 or 412. So when we cross that, I intentionally look at that river to see what's going on because I can gauge the spirit by what's happening at that river. Now, if you cross that river, you'll be able to catch that too. And I always see that it's all in all these years I've watched every time we've come through and it still ran to this day. The last time we went over it, I looked and that thing was literally bank to bank. And I've never seen it that full. So they must have got some super heavy rain over there. But praise God for it because it showed me. I immediately had a witness when I looked at it. It showed me immediately what God is planning to do in this region. Because he said it, that's a marker. 
that's a marker for you to watch what happens spiritually, I'll, I will provide it physically, the red roof and the river. So all these years, these two things have coincided with each other. They both have a witness on the inside, and I've never been able to get rid of it. I've never been able to shake it, and I've tried. I've tried with everything in me to just go away and leave it alone and just leave me alone, and it doesn't. And how do you know the Holy Spirit's good at that? He's good about bugging you right in that place where you just wish he'd leave you alone. And he just seems to stay right there because he's doing a work on the inside of us. So about three months ago, I'm out here mowing the yard on a Friday, and, and I was actually out there blowing the parking lot and the sidewalk off, and I was doing that, had headphones in. I mean, some of you might remember the story I told. I just didn't tell it with as much detail as I'm about to tell it. And I'm, out, I'm blowing the parking lot off, and I'm looking down at the ground, making sure I'm doing it, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see somebody pull up. And I kind of glance up, and when I look up, there's a man staring at me out of his car window. He's got his window rolled down, and he's staring at me. And I kind of look up and surprised to see him for sure. And I pull my earphones out and I walk over and I said, What are you doing? And he said, Hey, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be doing that work. That's for white people. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, that's funny. Because he's white. But it was still funny. Just and I was like, Well, I said, I don't mind it. I said it keeps me humble and I and I enjoy doing yard work. So I don't know if I'm going to, but I, I do right now. And, uh, and so I was like, well, I just, you know, it just keeps me humble and I enjoy doing it. And, and he's just kind of laughing. You know, we kind of had some chit chat. And then he looked at me and he said, hey, what's your plans for this church? What's your plans for the future of this church? And I said, well, we're, uh, we're kind of just, you know, saving money, raising money, and we're going to I guess buy some land, you know, we're kind of looking towards that, and, and that's about as far as we're at. He's like, so you haven't bought anything, you haven't done anything yet? And I said, no, no, not yet. And he's like, and he just kind of looked at me, and I was like, no, oh, this is awkward, just because of the whole thing. And I was just like, he said, I want to help you. He said, I feel like from the Lord that I'm supposed to help you. And I said, okay. And he said, let's go to lunch and let's talk. I said, okay. I always let somebody buy my lunch. So we go to lunch and we're talking about it. And he said, you know, I've watched your ministry. I've watched your church for over 10 years now. He said, and I've seen you grow. I've literally seen your church grow. He said, you, and I, I drive by it all the time. And I see it during services, and it's packed out, and you guys don't have the room to park. You don't have anything. You have outgrown your facilities. He said, and I want to help you. So we started having a conversation. We started having a conversation, not only just me and him, but we, of course, took it to prayer and started uh, fasting and praying on that because that's what we do. And then we started bringing our church council and their leadership team together. And start talking about possibilities. Well, fast forward three months from there, pretty much, and here I stand today telling you this long, drawn-out story so you have the idea of what I'm talking about. The place with the red roof is on the northeast side of town. It's this little bitty church, not any bigger than probably what that picture is back there, called Panhandle Bible Center. This church wants to come together with us. They want to merge with us. They want, basically, they want to absorb into our church and to literally give us their facility for free. You can't tell me God's not a good God. The first time I rode by that, it, that's what popped in my spirit. I was like, what the heck is this place? It's huge. What is this? But the other, th the other side of that coin that immediately was shown was this place is empty. Why is this place almost desolate? Because it's beautiful, but yet it is empty. You know what that's like. It's like, a big, it's like um, the mansion over on Sunset, that big nice house down there. It's a beautiful house, but most of the time it says it's empty. So it's a wonderful structure, but there's no life. There's not as much life. There, there's life. There's always been life there. 
But all these years from when it was there, how many of you ever been to Penhandle Bible Center? How many of you ever went to church there? Like went to church in there? Is anybody four square in here or is everybody just from Panhandle Bible Center? Okay, that's kind of the first service was too. It was like a bunch of people had come from there. And I've heard the stories. I've heard of what it was in the 70s and the 80s. I think it was started in the 60s, went through in the 70s and the 80s, and, and really got going strong, hence why the facilities are the way they are. They had a bunch of people, probably looked a lot like what we look like right now, out of room, growing, doing all these different things, and they needed more facilities to hold the future of what God was doing in that region, not just in that church, but in that region, and in the midst of that growing, the church got sideways and things started falling apart. I think there was a couple of church splits and it literally got left to the condition that it's in right now. Well, just because the enemy gets in doesn't mean God's done. Amen. And there is a faithful remnant like there always is because the word says that has stayed in that church all these years and have literally kept the doors open. They've kept the word being preached. They've kept the spirit of God in that place. I know. I've walked through it. I've walked into their original sanctuary, and the Spirit of God literally is neck deep from the moment you step in. You feel God just as much as you feel Him here. And it's amazing. And so all these years, I fought back and forth with that building over there because I knew God had a plan and a purpose. And that moment when I caught my spirit, I was like, what is that? And I came back to this church and I asked him, I said, there's a, there's a building over there. I said, what is that? I was like, I, I know it kind of looks like a church, but there's nothing there. So what is that? And they're like, where? And I was like, it's the building with the red roof. They're like, I bet you're talking about Panhandle Bible Center. Because, you know, if, if there's any place with the red roof besides the red roof in that's known in, in this area, it's that. But you know what? That church is known for something that's not as good as what it could be. Because I heard the stories first before I ever knew what it was. Just like this church was known for right before we came as a church that was here. But, oh, yeah, you're that little church on Quinn. You're that little church that never really is probably going to be anything. And here we are 11, almost 11 and a half years later. And I think we're a little bit more than where we used to be. But you know what? They look a lot right now, look a lot like we did when we came. The remnant, the faithful few are hanging on to that place. And yes, they're an older congregation. They're not old. They're older. Because the older I get, that's not as old anymore. So they're just older. And their youngest is probably mid to late 50s. Their youngest congregation member, they've probably got maybe 15 to 20 at best. Um, but the pastor there, I don't even know who Jim Jameson is. How can you not know who Jim Jameson is? That's what, that's what I got to say. That brother cuts up more than cards. I'm just like, man, you are funny. So we've been talking for the past three months. Our council has met with their board. We have our district involved in the uh, discussions that we were doing. And we're finally at a point, because we've walked this out for weeks on prayer, meeting together, talking about possibilities. What about this? How are we going to come together? All these different things. And we're finally at a place, literally today, on the 1st of July, to present it to the congregations. We're doing it here Pastor Jim is doing it there. I pray they take it as well as we're taking it. I don't know. You know, not, not, it's never 100% agreement, hardly ever, on things. You'll, have, you'll always have to, the moment great news comes about, you're going to immediately have to start battling all the what-ifs that start rolling up behind that. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? How are we going to do this? What about that? I don't know if it's got, you know. It's like we're all loving family until we actually have to be a family. And then it's like, well, I don't know. You're kind of weird looking, so I don't know if I want to be. And then there comes all these things. So I'm literally presenting this before you, not saying that we are doing it, because actually you're the final step in this process on this side. And we have to take this before the congregation, before the church, for all of you who are members of LifeWay, and we have to have a church vote on it. We have to vote with a two-thirds majority is how it passes within Foursquare, that we are in favor of taking what we do at 7th and Quinn and moving it to 1901 North Leela Street. Is that how you say it, Leela? Okay, yeah. 
That was the other part when I first saw it. I was like, what the heck is this street that I'm on? This is the weirdest looking street I've ever seen. Lalia, Lelia, Lulia, Lala. What is this thing? Okay. At 1901 North Leela Street. And that, as great as it can be, as great as the facilities are, I've got a couple of pictures I'm going to show you in just a minute. It still has to be finished. Everything's done in that complex except the big sanctuary that they built on. That's what sunk the boat. But that building is built. Pastor Jim told me, he said, this building was built to comfortably seat 600. 600. Not 160 like what we can see in here. 600. I think we have room to grow. Amen. We'll have a parking lot. We're going to make a big, giant, paved Walmart stinking parking lot around that thing. Just so we can all park together. But everything else in it is pretty much done. I mean, there's some other stuff. We'll need updates. We'll probably need to redo the heating and air units in it on the, on the north side of the complex. But the biggest part is that big, giant sanctuary that you're going to see here in just a minute. It, need, it literally is a shell. It's got the walls. It's got the ceiling. They just spent a couple years ago over $150,000 redoing that roof because it was too heavy, and it broke. They had some, uh, I forgot what kind of tiles. They were Spanish tiles or something. It was clay tile, and it was too heavy for the roof, and so it broke the middle part down, and I remember seeing that too. I was like, that roof looks weird. And so they spent over $150,000 of their money that they raised themselves with a skeleton crew. You can't tell me God can't do a lot with a little. And redid that entire roof, getting ready for the future. Because they knew that they weren't done yet. And to me, that brings more joy than being like, ha-ha, I'm going to get to go and, and finally get the fulfillment of what's been in my heart. That got broke years ago whenever I kept getting told no because my heart got broken there. And I was like, all right, fine. And the third time I was like, I don't, even want, I don't even care. I don't want it. But it never left. It stayed there. The biggest other side of that for me, especially as a pastor and as a leader in a church, is that we'll get to see the vision of that house fulfilled as well. That blesses me more than anything else. Because it's not just one congregation coming into a bigger facility, like what the surface would look like. Because I'm telling you, if we go through with this and do it, you better be ready for the ridicule that will come. Because nobody cares about you when you're a small church, but everybody loves to hate you when you start growing. And I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the other churches. You better be ready for what's to come. We're a church that operates in love and transparency. That will not change, no matter how big we get, whether we're 60 or 600 or 6,000, although we'll never be any bigger than about 1,500, but still. That'll never change, but other people's hearts and the conditions where they're in in life always does. So you better be ready when you talk about, oh, where do you go to church? Or, oh, they know where you go to church, especially if the move happens. It's not about us coming in to dominate and take over a bigger church. That's what merges are. They're corporate takeovers. We are not calling this a merge. This is not, I mean, it's for legality's sake and through the district and stuff, that's what it's classified as, as two churches merging together. But basically what they're wanting to do is Pastor Jim He's not old, he's just older, and as being older, he wants to quit doing what he's doing. He's looking towards the door of 81. I don't know if I want to be preaching at 81. I'm like, that now, 40 looks real young right now. But 80 still feels a little bit further down the block. And I'm like, I don't think I, I get tired after Sunday morning doing two services. I'm like, I'm ready for a nap. We're going across the state. Melinda's driving first thing so I can take a nap. I'm doing that at almost 40. What am I going to be doing at 81? Sleeping all day until that one, two hours of church comes? I mean, I don't know. But I do know that he is getting to the place where he's like, you know, I'm ready to pass this baton. I'm ready to pass this on to younger pastors, to a church leader, to a church that is thriving. And, oh, you're going to love this. A church that is younger. Just relishing that, younger. Yes, 
And their heartbeat is, they said, you know, we don't just want to pass the baton, but we want to come together with you so that life can come back to this campus again. They realize where they're at. They're not counted out by no means. That church would not be where it's at right now if it wasn't for them. But the very fact is they realize that they're limited with where they are and what they can do because they are older. You don't quite have the energy you used to at 20. Amen? If you are older past 20, you understand that somewhat. Well, they realize that, so they realize the life source and the lifeblood of the church is in the youth. It's in the younger it's in our teenagers. It's in our kiddos. That's where the next generations always come from. So they want to come together and blend together with us and basically just come under Foursquare and be Foursquare. But yet we take what we do as Lifeway over there. I imagine that once, if it goes through and we do all this stuff, I imagine when we get to the other side of this and come together, we'll probably have a brand new name anyway. Everything will get a fresh start right there. So you might want to work that in your heart, and I'm calling you to pray and fast this week. It can be whatever you want. And you're like, oh, great. It's not January. Well, I know. It's July. Same letter, good enough. During this 4th of July week, up until this next following Wednesday, so it'll be July 11th, so you got this week, because there's no service on this coming Wednesday. But that next Wednesday, we're going to get back together, obviously, because we're having church. But this service on Wednesday night is going to be a question and answer service. We're just going to have a feedback. We want to hear your hearts as the leadership. The staff will probably be up here, and for sure the council is going to be up here. We'll, we'll line this stage. We'll have a mic on the floor. And we want to hear from you. What do you think? You've had a week and pretty much a week and a half to pray about it, to fast on it for whatever it is. What do you think about this? What is God saying to you? Because that's the other side of this coin. Amen. It's you. It's not just leadership that hears God, although we get the direction from the Lord because we lead the church. But we do this thing together. We don't just come in and dictate our will and say, this is what's going to be. The church vote is the other deciding factor of that. So I'm calling you to fast and pray, whatever that is. For sure, pray. You can fast as little or as much as you want. I don't care. You just ask the Lord. He'll tell you what that part is. It just helps you hear him and sacrifice a little bit better. Fast and pray this week and a half. And when we get together on Wednesday, I want to hear your heart. We want to hear your heart. Because you know what? They're doing the very same thing. This next following Wednesday for them, they're going to get together. And they're going to talk about it. And then we're going to meet the next night and talk about it. And then probably that following week between that Wednesday and maybe the next Wednesday or maybe that Sunday, we'll just kind of see, we're going to cast a membership. We'll have a membership vote on it. Because we're slating for the first service of us coming together and having our first official service as a blended church on September 9th. That's just two months away. There's a whole lot of work that's got to happen in between now and then. Amen. Two of the biggest things that we need if we're going to meet in that big sanctuary that will be unfinished for a time, but if we need to get it up and going enough to meet in there, we've got to have, number one, electricity and heating and air. Unless you want to sweat like you're in the 1930s, and we'll skip the air part. But those are the two biggest factors that it does not have. I mean, it's got a few lights kind of like ours. I was like, hey, we got those in our church. We'll just do that. Anthony will love it. You love climbing up these ceilings. Wait till you get there. Them ceilings are about 30 foot tall. They're, it's a huge, it's a huge, beautiful complex that I'll show you in just a minute inside there. So that's our two biggest factors that we're really going to be looking towards. And if we can truly come together, it's going to take a little bit of dinero to get there. We've got about 60,000. They've got about 30 in their building fund. But if we can truly come together and, and make this a marriage type of thing, we can turn around and sell this property and use that money towards that sanctuary as well. And that would be at least another 300000 at least. But even with all that, it's not going to get it done. Amen? It takes all of us to do it together. And I wouldn't doubt it if we get through that thing between that and paving that giant parking lot and everything else we're going to have to do if it don't take a million dollars to finish that complex. But you know what? It's going to be one of the most awesome complexes in this city. 
I told him, I said, I, I mean, we've already been dreaming about it. And I said, I would love for this space to not just be a sanctuary for a big church, but this will be a concert space for this region too. How many people use the Texas County Activity Center for everything in, in the world? And it's fine and it works fine, but that's it. It's just fine. It's okay. I want someone when they come into a place to be like, wow, man, and that we can simply open our doors and say, you know what, you can use this place too. You don't have to just go to certain places all the time. You can come in here and use it. If you want to hold a concert, the stage on it is just a little bit bigger than the one I'm on right now. It would be plenty fine for that. So I want to take you through a couple of pictures of where we are now and what this place looks like and can become. So first picture, this is where you are now. God is taking us to this. This is progression from even where we used to be back in those first years. This is where we are now. Hey, man, I'm literally on this stage right now. Here's where God is going to take us in the future. If everything comes together, that's their stage. It's about eight or ten of these. That's because I'm standing back about 60, 70 foot from it, 80 foot maybe. All right, God's taking us from this. Here's our sanctuary right now. That's the biggest, widest shot I could take of our sanctuary. <laughs> and it's not very big, but we tried. Taking us from this to this. This is a wide shot of their sanctuary. There's a whole other triangle wing of that that we're under right there, and it goes back even further than that. But see how, look at it. It's unfinished. It's not done. It's got the floors poured. It's got the, the stage poured. And I, you talk about a beautiful ceiling. That ceiling is awesome. I'm like, dude, we need to have like trapeze artists swinging through there during worship. It'd be awesome. It's huge, and it's wonderful. Big, giant wood, oak beams up there, wonderful. But when you look from the top down, everything else needs to be done. Okay, so that's that wide sanctuary. And then God's taking us from this. This is a shot of our campus. I'm literally standing on the corner at there at 7th and Quinn, trying to get as much of that in there as I can to this. This is one, one angle, one wide shot of their campus. That's that building. Just on the south side, there's a whole lot more on the north side. And they literally own from those, there's little bit trees right there. They own from that lot of those trees all the way to the First Baptist Church, all the way to that street. I forgot what street that's called. So there's plenty of property to grow in the future as well. Amen. I already told them, I said, you've got the perfect name, even though we've already talked about changing our names and stuff. I said, Panhandle Bible Center is the perfect name for a Bible institute. I think we need a Bible college in Guyman. Who, why do we got to go downstate? Why do we got to go online? Why do we got to go somewhere else to find God and to get biblical training? I praise God for Billy Joe and Victory Bible. We couldn't have what we had without him. But you know what? Why can't we provide that here? Why can't we raise up a church that has hundreds in the church and they're going to Bible college right here, getting their degrees and being planted out in churches all over the world? There's no reason why they can't. And you know what? We're part of a great denomination that has a giant Bible college in San Dimas called Life Pacific that would gladly link hands with us and bring us in as a satellite campus right here. We've got a great place called the King Seminary down in Dallas, Texas under Gateway Church that Pastor Jack Hayford owns that would gladly hold hands with us and bring that as a satellite campus here because we're Foursquare. We're part of the family. So God's got some big things that we could do. The options and the, the, the stuff is limitless to it. And we're not just going to be a bigger church. We're going to be a church that has united. What kind of example will that set to the churches around here? The churches that are truly coming together, not for a Thanksgiving or an Easter service. Community services don't count. That's like 50 people from a few of the churches that are just coming to sit in the same place. I'm talking about churches uniting and working literally together, enfolding into themselves, hmm, like the vision that Ezekiel saw in chapter 1. That they are working within themselves and just simply coming together saying, you know what, guys, let's just do this thing together. What kind of example would that set? What if other churches followed that example and started coming together and say, you know what, we're better together than separate. We're stronger together than we are trying to be two separate works. 
We're doing great and doing fine here. They're doing fine there. But you know what? We're out of room, and they've got the room. They're out of people, and we've got plenty of people. I think we ought to just come together and see what God wants to do. So this next week and a half, this is the option that we are presenting. We are presenting to come together and blend together with their church. That means as soon as we get back from the fourth, we're going to hit the ground running and start making changes, and everything's going to start changing really quick. So we better get ready if that's the case. As soon as we vote and it's on, we've got a two-thirds majority, and they've got a two-thirds majority, it's on. We're going to start switching stuff. We're going to start stripping this building out as much as we can and start moving stuff over there. Your Saturdays are going to be full for the next five years of your life because we're going to need your help. You know, we got paid staff, but we're not that awesome. We, we need some more arms. So Iron Fellowship, get ready. We're going to be working. But you know what? How fun are those times? How fun is it when we're doing something new together and you're going to gain probably 15 to 20 new family members right off the bat? You already know how to love. You already know how to accept people as they are. Amen. So them coming in, and I tell you, they are sweethearts of people. They just, they're just so loving. We've met with them several times with the board, at least. I haven't seen all the rest of the congregation. But we've met with them, and they've got a heart that just loves. They love Jesus just as much as we love Jesus on this side of town. And that's wonderful because that means we can come together. Theologically, we are very, very similar. They're just a spirit filled and speak in tongues and throw anointing oil and do as everybody else does. We literally went on Thursday uh, and met with them. And, man, we lathered up anointing oil like we were taking a bath. And we hit that entire campus. And we, we anointed doors and went through places and prayed. And, and, just, and we all did it together. It was so much fun to come out of that room. And we just scattered like fighter jets just all over that place, just going at it. We've got a great future ahead. Whatever God has promised you, that's why I said that at the beginning, whatever God has promised you, don't count it out just because it hasn't come to pass. At the right time, it'll happen. I honestly never thought this day would come. But when I heard those first three words from Billy Joe, I knew it would. I just didn't know when. When I answered the phone, he said, go for it. I knew it was sealed. Because it meant too much on the inside of me to leave me alone, and I knew God had a plan and a purpose how it's all going to come together, how, where's all the money going to come from, if it's going to take a good probably million dollars to make that thing finish, I don't know. I'm not a millionaire. I'm a hundredaire. It's about as good as it goes usually after payday. So I'm not there. But you know what? God can use the little that we have, whatever that looks like, and he can multiply that a hundred times over. I'm pretty sure there's a, there's a story about loaves and fishes in there somewhere, and it's not the place down the street. Yeah, that God can do so much, and that's the coolest part about it. Is it going to be a faith walk and a faith step? Absolutely. I'm already, I woke up this morning in a ball of emotions. I'm better now because I finally got it off my chest. I've been holding this thing for like three months. That's, that's kind of hard to do, especially when it's that. But you know what? I'm dropping the bomb, and then I'm getting out of town. You can't ask me anything. I will not answer my phone. If you got any questions, you go talk to Pastor Jim. How about that? I told him, I said, I'm leaving, Jim. It's up to you, buddy. You can handle him. He's like, well, then I'm leaving too. I'm getting out of here. But you know what? I think God's got a bright future for us. If we all go, praise God. If people don't want to go and, you know, oh, I like it here and I want to stay, I don't know what you're going to do. No one's going to be here if, that, if it happens. But you know what? We're going to have to contend with all that stuff because they're not, in reality, they're not leaving any. They're not going anywhere. They're simply accepting us as we come. But in reality, we're leaving everything. For all of us who've been here from the beginning, for all the, the originals that have been here before I was even, we were even here, we're leaving everything that we've ever known. I can tell you that's hard. I've already done it before. It's hard. Even if it's a little campus at 7th and Quinn, this is our lifeline. This is home base. This is all we know. So to go over there to be great, I'll be in an office that's not the nursery, I'll love it. I hate that pink carpet, but I'll be in a better place, and that's okay. I'm ready to make the change. But you know what? The other side of that is, is all the memories we have here. That stuff is hard. Those can be holy cows if you're not careful, but you've got to be willing to put those on the altar and move forward with what God has for you. You can always look back and say, praise God for that property on Quinn, for whatever happens to it. 
Praise God that so many people, hundreds of people found Jesus, found life, found healing, found renewal, got married here, had memorial services here. Praise God for it. But you know what? If you make an altar where it was simply supposed to be a campsite, you'll never progress. This is simply a campsite in the desert, in the wilderness. God's called us to move on. The cloud is moving on, and we, it'd be smart for us to follow. Amen. So pray about it this week, week and a half-ish. We'll probably talk about it again on Sunday. Um, I'll get a report from him on how it went. I'm going to call him on the way and talk to him. Um, I'll give you a, probably an update on Sunday, but pray about it. Drive by that place. Don't drive around it. It'll probably call the cops on you. But drive by it and look at it. Just tell me, you know, get it in your heart. What do you see? What do you feel? I mean, you got the freedom to dream all over that place. And it's awesome. It really is. But we're going to have room for an entire children's wing, an entire youth section. The youth are going to actually have their own space. They've had to share all these years. They shared with the kids, and now they're sharing with us. And because of the campus we're in, it limits us. It stifles us. They're going to have their own space to go do whatever they want, almost whatever they want. And we're going to have our own space. We're going to have plenty of office space. I'm already looking at expanding our staff. You're not going to get paid for it, but we're going to expand, we're going to expand it. We're going to have plenty of rooms for Sunday school. Hallelujah. We're going to bring that back. We're going to have plenty of rooms for our OSL classes. They're going to have their own wing. We're going to set that up, have a satellite campus, hopefully in the future for our school. All that stuff. And we've got the room for it. We just simply walk into it and say, yes, Lord. Lord, let it be however and whatever you want to do, we're on board. Amen? See, I told you it's worth coming to church. When you miss church, you never know what's going to happen. You never know. But you know what? No matter what, God's in it. So we want you to hook in with this and be a part of us. If you're not a part of us or if you're not a member, I had some come ask me after the first service. They were like, do you have to be a member to be able to vote and stuff? And I was like, yeah, you do. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, if you want to do that and become a part of this church, be a part of this family, you're not just going to be a part of here. You're going to be part of a, an exponentially larger family in the near future. But you know what? We will love you just the same. We'll have another membership class. We'll have another baptism service. We'll do those things to where, where we just continue to grow because the way has already been paved here. As I heard yesterday from someone who gave an example to Melinda, your goldfish only grows as big as the bowl you put it in. Our goldfish are uh, as big as we can get in this bowl. It's time to expand our goldfish bowl. Amen. It's time to get a little bigger and see if we can move from being goldfish to those koi fish. I want to be a big, giant, mutant goldfish for Jesus. And people look at me, they go, dang, that's the craziest looking thing I've ever seen. That's what I want to be. We want to be that kind of work. And people look at it and go, wait a minute, wasn't that that little church on 7th and Quinn? Wasn't, you know, I want to hear that again. Weren't you guys the Foursquare Church? Especially if we get a new name, nobody's going to know who we are. And that's going to be awesome. We can, like, come in incognito and be like, yeah, we're whatever. And be like, where are you from? Ah, oh, don't worry about it. Just let's go do something. Amen? So are you excited? Anybody not want to do it at this point? You'll have this week to contend with your emotions and your feelings and all that stuff. But you know what? God's faithful to the future every single time. I honestly thought the day would never come, and I really honestly gave up. After that third time, I was like, I'm done. I quit. It's over. It's not going to happen. I'm done. I quit. But just because we quit doesn't mean God quits. So stay faithful in whatever it is. I'm making two things. I'm not only making a big announcement. I told Anthony, I'm officially retiring one of my old faithful Bibles. This Bible is what I used the first Sunday I came here. So you're like, oh, my God, it's a Bible. Why are you crying? But this Bible has been with me a lot of, a lot of places, a lot of years. So this, this first time when I lay, when I had that Sunday, it was this pulpit. I laid it on this pulpit and opened it up and went, oh, God, here we go. I don't even know what I'm doing. Okay, here we go. Somebody open your Bibles to something. I don't even know where I'm at. And here we went. So today, literally everything changes. You can't, you can't go back. This service is no longer just a Lifeway service. And that's, to me, that's why it's emotional because it, you got to let go of the past to move on to the future. 
And so this is no longer the same way. From here on out, we'll have us and PBC in our minds, in our hearts. We'll start working and melding together. And everything that we knew as this church and this Foursquare is kind of over now. So in commemoration of that, I'm going to retire the first Bible. I've only got about 80 more in my office, but still, I'm going to retire this one and still uh, and, and preach from another. I'm going to actually uh, take two with me across the state and center down on one that as we go to literally meet the nations across town, there will be one single translation I'll preach out of. That's just really hard to do, so you might pray for me on that. Amen? Okay, let's get out of here because I'm going to cry. So let's stand up. It's 1230, so that's about right. So God's got some good stuff in store. I'm telling you. Monday, do you want to say anything or add anything to it? I just say, you know, um, I've got to see his vision, you know, lived out. And it's been awesome. And several of us have actually has vi- had visions of this sanctuary. We just didn't know it. I wish Isaiah was here, our son, because... Um, a month before Pastor Jim came here, Isaiah told me, he said, I w- we were in worship and the Lord showed me our new church. And he said, Mom, and he started crying. And he said, Mom, when we get in that new sanctuary, he said, the anointing is going to be so strong. He said, it's going to draw people from everywhere. And um, he said, I know what the church building looks like. I know what the church sanctuary looks like. He said, I, I, the Lord showed me everything. And I remember we were, I was sneaking around town. And I, I said, I said, look at that church, Isaiah. And Isaiah started crying. And he goes, oh, that's, that's the church. And he saw it. And so when I first got the news, I'm just going to tell you all, fear began to set in because I have a hard time with change. I knew I know what God has called us to, but I also have whole re- reservations. You know, I'm a very uh, half half full type of person, but there's still some fears that try to come in. And about three weeks ago, I sat in the room with their board and our board, and I got to and our and our staff, and I, they went around the room, and I just began to share, and I heard from their hearts, and they all had one vision, and that was to grow the kingdom. We're not trying to be different churches. We just want to grow the kingdom together as a church body that that the Lord has called us to. And I just began to tell them, I said, you know, I've been a pastor's daughter forever. And I'm going to tell you all that I was, I'm scared. I said, I saw my daddy have three heart attacks building a church that was just like that. And I said, it scares me. My dad would call for work nights, and nobody would show up. It was just he and I. So it scares me. But after hearing their hearts and after hearing the same vision, I thought, if God is for this, nothing can be against it. And I have such a peace about it. I already love their people. I mean, I feel like I'm the mom there as well already. And uh, I just encourage you all. Somebody said it in that room that night. They said, cast out fear and immediately speak faith. And so as soon as a fear thought comes, oh, no, it's going to take this much money. Oh, no, we can't do this. You start to speak, God, you are for this. Nothing is going to be against this in Jesus' name. You start speaking it out. And so we're just going to, Dallas and I have never done this. We don't know what we're doing. We are the type that will not act like we know what we're doing. We'll tell you. If you know how to do this, come help us. We are willing to seek counsel, and we're in this together. Amen? And so I would like to close service if pastor's okay with it. And I would just, we did this when I was in the Baptist church, and I remember this Sunday that my dad stood up in front of everybody, and he said, God has called us to a bigger vision. He said, I want you to grab hands with the person to the right and to the left of you. And we're going to be a family of God, and we're going to do this together. And so I ask for us to do that this morning.